back to my firm like five years ago and then left soon after to help blockchain companies um, realize quickly couldn't help them because no lawyers could give us good legal advice. So I co-founded the Blockchain Association, which is the biggest industry and lobbying firm in the States or um, industry association in the States for crypto. And so my work over the last four years, four and a half years, I guess, has been kind of as a generalist in the space. I've helped raise capital. I've worked at VCs. I have um, continued to work in advocacy a ton. So on that front, uh, I co-founded an organization in Canada called the Web3 Council, which is like the Blockchain Association sister company here. Um, and I now work for the Interchain Foundation uh, primarily and advise them on policy. And I do the same with the Ethereum Foundation. And I run an organization called the Dow Research Collective, which attempts to pool capital from uh, a variety of different organizations and use that capital to, to buy and open source research relevant to Dow operation. We're funded primarily by the EF, but also Ave grants actually, and Uniswap grants and Compound grants. Um, and we're hosting an event on September 1 at Stanford with uh with medigov and others um to get more funding for research for DAOs and to open source of the community so i'm interested in constitution and duties i have like some idea of it through my legal world but i know Camille, you have a much better understanding of me for me than me um and particularly from like a non-legal legal perspective i'm super interested to hear and and hopefully can contribute thanks connor um Hey all, I am John Wu, head of growth at Aztec Network. We are a privacy first ZK rollup on Ethereum. Um, I think this concept of duties and credible neutrality and uh, having an inclusive stakeholder conversation is extremely front of mind for me, especially today. Um, so I may have to jump in an emergency setting uh, if that comes up. Um, so yeah, very, very focused on obviously come from a comms and marketing perspective, but kind of like practically living up to commitments to stakeholders um, throughout a specific project's ecosystem. And yeah, very interested in hearing some of the legal stuff and Connor excited that um, you're, at, you, you're with your work at Blockchain Association. And uh, Abby, obviously radical has been really front of mind too, given you know the tornado cash uh, GitHub censorship. So yeah, very excited to hear everyone's perspective. Awesome. Um, I think there are two people who are here, but not here in this mountain interface. Could that be? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Um, okay, cool. Uh, well, thank you all, <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, both for the intros and for joining. Um, I want to use this time to share a couple of examples from um, corporate institutions that I've worked with in designing alternative uh, governance structures, and then also um, a few historic examples um, that predate uh, any any conversation about crypto or or, or even corporations. Um, before we do that, I'll I'll briefly introduce myself. I'm Camille. Um, I came to this question and, and the topic of governance. Um, five years ago, I set, ran a set of real estate development projects in Northern California that were focused on affordable housing and community building um, and ended up being sort of the center of um, a bunch of different stakeholders and, and their interests. I was like the public face to all these residents and community members who wanted to see housing build. Um, I was the connection to private equity um, that was trying to come in and, and participate in these deals. I knew everyone in, in City Hall um, and at the county. And um, it was a fan really fascinating experience, but also a really frustrating one because um, basically it was proof or an example of people having a really hard time navigating uh, change together and having a hard time making decisions and solving problems. And I got really interested in this question of how can we do that better? Um, after that, I started an organization called Purpose. It's part of an international networked organization focused on alternative ownership, governance, and finance, primarily in the corporate space, um, helping startups raise alternative venture capital. Our work in the U.S. focused really heavily on mid to large size businesses, founders who had started their companies to change technology or food systems or healthcare, and were finding themselves, uh, you know, 30 years into an organization 
needing to get liquidity to retire, but not wanting their legacy to be undermined uh, through the sale to private equity or, or a multinational. And so we helped them and, and the work continues beyond me um, devise ownership structures that basically transitioned the, the companies into the commons and developed stakeholder inclusive governance um, and uh, economic ownership models um, to steward the mission intergenerationally and the companies intergenerationally. Uh, now, as of this year, um, have switched into the blockchain space. Um, I, I, I have become increasingly interested in how to build models of collaboration and cooperation at scale. Um, the experience of working with you know, people in organizations and in communities within purpose really it was a very like enriching experience in the sense that I, I had the opportunity to watch people effectively collaborate with each other in a world in which there aren't a lot of examples of that happening um, in healthy and generative ways. And um, yeah, got really curious about how to do that digitally. Um, and so now I've started a lab around governance and, and Web3 that I can can tell you more about at the end, but I'm going to zoom through this uh, presentation because yesterday I thought that I wouldn't fill 30 minutes of time and somehow I am more long-winded than I knew myself to be. So um, I'm, I'm got conscious of that. Can you all see this? Yeah, cool, awesome. Um, let me just organize my very messy desktop. So I want to start off just by framing this question of like, what is the objective of governance? I think when we think of governance, not ironically, you know, the, the title of this conversation is around rules and constitutions. But I think of when we think of governance, I think we commonly think of it as the rules overlaid on top of a system. But that kind of, in my mind, undermines the question of like, why, why do we care at all around governance? And what is actually the purpose of these systems? And from my perspective, I think of governance as the systems and processes by which people can navigate direct and coordinate change over time. And the goal, it, particularly uh, on the blockchain and within these new organizational types, is to create systems in which people can act interdependently with each other rather than solely in, in independent ways to obtain joint benefit. Um, I'm, after doing, somehow becoming a governance wonk over the last five years, what I've found consistently is that uh, what underpins the rules often um, are the driving factors behind systems being fragile and breaking and also determine the, the need to have more rules and more complexity in systems. And so if, if what we see on the surface, I should have done like a, a, a whoa, word, um, iceberg, iceberg like the tip is what we think of as governance of the rules, but what's underpinning it are these core aspects of a system's design. Um, purpose is, I think, uh, somewhat obvious. Without a clear and common objective for collaboration, systems lose their stickiness, um, and they also end up with a lot of conflict. I think that purpose is what helps elicit people's imagination for collaboration at scale. Um, connected to that is, is obviously culture. Um, you know, it is very difficult to get people to be in dialogue with each other if they don't have a common set of norms or a common understanding of what the principles and values are by which we will develop norms. Um, when I, when I say power distribution and value distribution, what I'm really talking about is ownership. Um, so we often think of ownership, particularly in a conventional legal sense, as a as a combination of a set of legal uh, excuse me a set of economic rights and a set of governance rights and in many cases in most cases and i think the way that we think about it is that you know the more money i bring into a system the more power i buy 
And part of what I want to encourage in this conversation is to think about these things as two separate levers that we can play with to develop uh, more adaptive systems. And then lastly, incentives. You know, um, if you have misaligned incentives between stakeholders that are obvious uh, from the onset, it's not going to be surprising, uh, you know, or, or it shouldn't be surprising when um, when conflicts emerge and, and when systems break down. So I think about this question of why ownership matters here as the there the misalignments in the system between stakeholders are what undermine the system and its ability to support collaboration over time. And the more misalignments we have, like I said, the more we need to rely on rules in order to navigate change. And this is really costly and very fragile. Um, I think that we see this all the time, right? Particularly in corporate structures where this default relationship between money and power often leads to outcomes that don't benefit the whole. Um, it's kind of a, it's a bit of a wonky thought for 8 a.m., but I think that we know this intuitively, right? If we look at the prison system as an example, we know that the private ownership structure of that is leading to outcomes that are negative. If people are incentivized through their private ownership to have more people in prison for a longer period of time, that's driving consequences within the individual lives of people who are participating within that system, the community around it, and society at large. Um, so a kind of dramatic example for, for the why ownership matters and, and the ripple effect that it can have um, throughout an organization or more broadly. So I think that when we, when we think of economic incentives as one lever and uh, participation or power as another lever, that we give ourselves more space, more de design space to, to develop adaptive systems that support long-term value creation. What do I mean by this? Um, <laughs> decoupling money from power allows us to create more nuanced systems of participation from a broader set of stakeholders who participate and contribute to value creation in a system. And I think it also allows us to develop more nuanced and more context specific definitions for what value is in a system and then to reward different forms of contribution in monetary and non-monetary ways. And then lastly, I think what happens as a consequence of this flexibility is that it allows us in turn to be more creative about how we distribute value and how we distribute power in ways that support the cultural worldview of an ecosystem or organization. Um, and in doing so, I think also opens up the possibility um, to expand what's possible as it relates to incentive structures. Um, so when I think about, this is like, you know, a meta, meta, meta on some level around systems design and to ground it slightly, uh, when I think about what I have seen worked well and what we know from historical research, there are a set of sort of guiding principles. These aren't the best practices. We'll, we'll get to those later, but really guiding principles of how we should think about or what we need to consider uh, when we think about governance. The first one is that these systems have to be bespoke, like good rules need to be context specific and based on the specific attributes of a system. What is the cultural worldview of the people who are participating? What is the stakeholder composition? What is the size of the uh, organization or ecosystem? What are the political, economic, industry conditions? What's the time frame and intent behind the time frame for this organization? Uh, and what are its objectives? Um, there's not, unfortunately, I think a set of like, here's, here's how to design governance for every system <laughs> that is going to function well. In fact, um, again, the more, the more we 
design systems or design these rules and constitutions for specific systems, I think the more generative it is uh, around the functionality of them. Um, the next point is this question of dynamic tension. Also, I don't, I, if you are asking questions, I am not seeing you. Okay, cool. Um, the, the next point is around dynamic tension, um, which is the question for me is like, how do you support interdependence between participants so that people aren't just making decisions based off of their own individual self-interest in a system, but where they're put into a position, and sometimes it's an uncomfortable one, between making decisions that are oriented around their own short-term self-interest and often the longer term interest of the whole. Um, we want people to do that, right? And most of the governance structures that we see in the corporate space are really driven behind independent actors making decisions, um, I think primarily around the objective of profit um, and yeah, we don't adequately put people in a tension position to be making decisions in that way. The next is around power and responsibility and the relationship between them. So we need to have legitimate relationship between power holders and responsibility in a system. I think if anyone's ever had a job or worked for someone who had a lot of responsibility but no power, you've seen the frustration of this. And when we amplify that onto political or larger um, community levels, it can become really destructive. Um, and then the last one is around conservation versus adaptability. So how much should a system change or not change? Uh, obviously, the, the, the benefit of conservation being that systems remain stable and people can build on top of them and they are reliable versus adaptability, which is really allowing people to respond to change in real time um and this point of oh go ahead oh wait did someone have a question or was someone just unmuted cool um this idea of the ladder of security being you know I, one of the things that i have noticed and came up in the conversation yesterday that we had with the folks who are participating was a lack of structure around how difficult it should be to make a given decision or conversely, how easy it should be to make a given decision. And we're gonna walk through a couple of examples in a minute. The constitutional components of a system typically are very, very difficult to change, right? And we want them to be difficult to change because they provide that stability. And the way that we um, make it difficult is by creating large thresholds, whether it be, you know, consensus or whether it be multiple different uh, bodies having to weigh in. And some of the cases um, in the legal structures that we're going to walk through, you actually have to have a third party outside person approve some of the decisions um, in order to provide that stability. I'm going to pause here. Does anyone have any questions? Hey, Toby. Hi, Camille. All good. Can you, can you actually just define the ladder of security? Is the ladder the structure that you're saying, the structure that you use to define what level of like conservation or of uh, a set of rules should be? Or like how conserved? Yeah, it's more just like of a framework of thinking about it, like rather than a pool of decisions and we have to sort of think about, you know, how we want decision X to be made, thinking about decisions in a somewhat hierarchical sense or on a spectrum of how easy or difficult that decision should, should be to make. And there are, I think, decisions that we wanna have be very difficult to make if, you know, um, if we're going to change the, let's say the constitution of the United States in some way, we want a high level of friction in the system to make that change happen. Conversely, if we're talking about, you know, approving budgets, that's an operational decision that should probably be relatively simple to make. And so the framework is really around helping us sort 
how hard or easy decisions should be made based off of the role that they play in the system, short term and long term, and also the impact that they have on, on different stakeholder groups. Did that answer your question? Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Yeah. Um, da -da. So this first example um, is from a company that we helped uh, recapitalize and transition into this ownership structure a few years ago. Organically Grown Company is the second largest wholesale distributor of organic produce in the country. And they started as a nonprofit like 40 plus years ago to help uh, educate farmers on organic farming. Uh, and then they converted into a farmer cooperative. And then they had an S Corp. And then they had an ESOP. And now they ended here. And I, I say that in part because it's an example of how organizational and also structural design can benefit from iteration over time as organizations and their purpose and the stakeholders who are participating become more complex. Um, but a couple of years ago, they had this ESOP. They were really worried. The ESOP was nearing 51% ownership. They were concerned that if they had, they got a strategic offer, that they would have to sell the business, even though the employees didn't want to do it. The farmers didn't want to do it. No one in the ecosystem around this company would want the, would want the business to be sold. And so we converted 100% of the company's ownership into this purpose trust structure, which like side note uh, for a boring legal lecture you didn't know you were getting into, a purpose trust is a really weird and very awesome legal structure. Trusts are strange in general, but Purpose trusts are cool because uh, they run in perpetuity. Most trusts in the United States do not. Um, and rather than having a living person as a beneficiary, these trusts have a purpose. And so historically, they've been used to like, make sure you know, my wealthy blah, blah, blah's parrot is fed for the rest of its life or that my art collection is dusted adequately. And we co-opted basically a very flexible structure to um, redefine the fiduciary duty of corporate institutions and also develop more inclusive governance models. Um, turns out if you want to do weird things in the law, just like look to where wealthy people have found a lot of flexibility for themselves and, and use it um, in, in radically different ways. Um, so the, the purpose here, which is really the constitution um, of this organization shifted from, okay, the, the objective here is to maximize profit. We have an ESOP, we have conventional shareholders. We're going to have a board meeting on a quarterly basis and talk about how much money we made everyone um, into a purpose that is about the long-term stewardship of this company and any other assets that come under the trust. The focus is on furthering sustainable food and agriculture. The structure of the document is like three sentences about furthering sustainable food and agriculture, and then 10 clarifications that outline how uh, the trust should treat uh, stakeholders, both in governance and in profit sharing. Um, organically Grown Company has done a lot of advocacy work over the last couple of decades. And so there's um, some language about the role that the company or the trust should play broadly in pushing forward. Uh, for more sustainable systems. Uh, there's provisions around employees. There's provisions around, um, you know, farmers. There's there's a list of clarifications to what that purpose means at a more granular level. Granular is kind of a misnomer. I, I think of it really, like it is like the Constitution of the United States. It's designed to be high level enough that people can interpret it with flexibility. Um, and the language is also crafted in a way that is, um, independent of the nomenclature of our time around um, around sustainability. So like nowhere in the purpose trust documents does the word organic come up because the assumption is in 20 years or 50 years or however long in the future, uh, that may not be the language that we use to talk about uh, sustainable food systems. And so it's intentionally designed to be flexible and sort of neutral so that people can um, effectively like interpret the language going forward. Um, the governance structure of this is the company has five key stakeholder groups, employees, investors, farmers, and community. They vary in size. There's about three investors. There are hundreds of farmers uh, and thousands of community members. 
And on an annual basis, everybody gets together in a room. Uh, the last one that happened was pre-COVID. It was very magical. Uh, and elects one of a three-person um, committee. And I think of the role of that committee as really as like the guardians of the assets. So the operating board reports to the committee based off of metrics that they've developed for the purpose trust statement and its clarifications. So as an example, the language around policy and advocacy work means the board now has to report to the trust committee on what exactly it did. How did it contribute to advocacy? How many dollars did it spend? How many activities did it participate in? Um, and on and on. And it has the power to remove um, board members. Um, the community members also have the ability when they, if there is reason to believe that, you know, or evidence that the committee members aren't upholding the trust, aren't acting in ways that undermine the purpose, uh, there are a set of checks and balances that allow those people to, um, there's a process basically outlined in the, in the purpose statement. Um, this breakdown is also the breakdown of how value is distributed. Um, and so these five key stakeholder groups are also the stakeholder groups that participate in profit sharing to varying degrees. Uh, there was a, a large conversation around what is fair, um, given that, you know, farmers and customers are already participating economically. Investors took a concessionary return. There was really like a, a multi-stakeholder negotiation around this question of fairness as it relates to value distribution in the short term and a process for changing it in the long term. It's like a pretty dope example. <laughs> like, and, and, and I know it's like a mission-driven example and like, oh, you know, some like hippies in Oregon like got together and started this cool business. But I think that it's a really, really incredible example of interdependence. When COVID hit, the company, and not the company, but the, all the stakeholders got together and put together more than like a million dollars worth of grants for the farmers because they knew uh, if the farmers couldn't survive through COVID, the rest of the ecosystem would uh, fall apart. And so they were willing to, in the short term, put aside their own self-interest around having you know, profits distributed in order to protect the functionality of this ecosystem over time. Um, it is that kind of interdependence, I think, that a lot of projects in, in the crypto space are trying to cultivate um, that is just well laid out here. I'm, I'm being very long-winded again. I have two more examples. I'm gonna run through them real quick. Um, so these other two examples are other uh, examples of purpose trust. Uh, one is Firebrand Bakery. Matt Kreutz, the founder of it, is like, I don't know, a bodhisattva on earth. He's just an incredible human being. Um, started the company 12 years ago, bootstrapped it. It's a, it's a bakery, but it also, uh, its mission is really around um, providing quality jobs to folks who are formerly incarcerated or formerly without houses. Um, and so we helped him and the company raise a few million dollars to launch a consumer packaged goods brand and in the process set up this purpose trust. And I, I list it as an example here for two reasons. One is um, the composition of the trust committee is radically different and the processes for electing those people and their role in the business is very different from organically grown company. There is an overlap between the trust committee and the operating board here. Um, you also have employees is obviously center, the founder is still participating, and then there are two community allies one who's an individual person who works with, who lives in, in, in Oakland, who knows um, this demographic of people very well, and the other is a representative from an organization that is providing direct aid to folks as they exit uh, the prison system um, and, and really sits on the trust as, as an advocate for that community of people or those communities of people, I should say. Um, and, and so composition is reflective of context here. Uh, and is also reflective of the age of the institution. So this separation of, um, you know, guardianship within this trust committee around organically grown is really different here. We have an overlap. 
Um, and, and I think over time, what we will see is the founder will step away at some point. There will probably be a separation between the trust committee and the board as, as the system matures and as, um, as more people become involved too, is the other sort of very practical component of these governance structures. Um, and then the last one is trust neighborhoods, uh, which is a model that we helped a, a nonprofit build mixed income neighborhood trust. They hold typically between 10 and $20 million worth of housing in a purpose trust structure in perpetuity. The objective is to facilitate the creation of mixed income neighborhoods by keeping those assets at their current rate. And so it's a, it's a reinterpretation of affordable housing. Um, we worked with the first one that they did in, in Kansas City, and we did a community engagement process over the course of eight weeks on Zoom on Wednesday nights to um, define the purpose of this trust and, and its governance structure. And when we started, I was like, this is going to be a shit show. Like, I have sat in so many boardrooms and tried to explain governance to people, and people's eyes glaze over. Everyone thinks that they're going to be really excited to talk about governance, but it turns out that people really, really dislike making decisions about how people are going to make decisions. It's like, it's not fun, right? And so when we started with this project, I was like, oh my God, this is going to be really hard um, to get 12 people who are like, you know, calling in on Zoom from the playground with their children or making dinner or like are still at work to participate in it. I was totally wrong. It was like the best process that I ever did around defining a purpose and developing governance. People had a lot of skin in the game. They really cared about how decisions would be made about these assets. They really cared about displacement. They really ca cared about predatory landlords. They really cared about having diversity continue in the community. They, they, they had very clear objectives um, and also understood the need to build systems that were not dependent on having the right people in the room. They really wanted to set folks up who, you know, in 20 years may not have been part of the process um, to be put into a system where they could continue to make good decisions around the assets. Um, this like kind of restored my faith in humanity after COVID, like during COVID, honestly, I was like, thank God, <laughs> Kansas City <laughs> um, is, is showing the, an example of the civic mind coming into action. Um, this is a like very famous uh, or famous in the weird wonky world of governance, um, Ostrom example of similar systems uh, functioning well over time, similar in the sense that obviously within the context of purpose trust, we are relying on an existing legal system to do enforcement. Um, and, and the primary reason why we ended up with purpose trust and part of the reason, like part of my motivation to move away from that work is that it's very difficult in the US from a securities perspective and from a tax perspective to distribute ownership to non-accredited investors. And so we basically use the purpose trust as a proxy for ownership. Um, it, we protected the rights of ownership through the trust structure, but we weren't distributing ownership to individuals. Um, and obviously within Web3, like, we, we get to do that in, in new ways. Um, this is an example of really a self-governing system that has lasted over a thousand years near Valencia. Water is, is very, very scarce. And so they developed a system of a constitution um, as well as a really uh, robust nesting structure of governance. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm now looking at your chat. Uh, <laughs> a nesting structure of governance um, between, you know, the the highest level being a thousand ish miles of river that is being um, governed to a landscape view to a farm scale. And there are councils and systems of conflict resolution at each scale of the system. Um, and it's been very, very successful in an area where there is a lot of conflict. Uh, there hasn't been any violence in a thousand years around water. Um, and part of that is that there's a very clear common culture and set of norms around stewarding this water uh, and participating in it. And there's also um, to think of the short-term and long-term decision-making tension. 
the, the ability to resolve conflict in a system where you are not just making decisions for yourself, but also for the ability for your children or grandchildren to participate in this irrigation system changes your perspective on how you approach conflict. Um, and it's been, it's been, yeah, it's an incredible example. Um, I'm going to fly through this. Uh, this is an, a, a sort of breakdown of how to think about nesting constitutions and rules. So if we have at the highest level constitution, this is about formulation and, and governance and modification to the system, very difficult to change, um, is what influences collective choice, which I think of as like policy making, and then lastly, operational decisions. This is, again, like a kind of reframing both of the ladder of security in terms of how hard should it be to change something, but also a breakdown of how when we think of um, the application of rules throughout a system from day to day operations on one end to the foundational elements, how are those rules influencing each other? Okay, um, so why do systems, why do these systems fail? I should have said, why do these systems struggle? Because not all the examples here have actually failed. But the first one is uh, Facebook's oversight board, which is also a purpose trust. It's like the most, it's the most famous example of people who know what the hell a purpose trust is. Problem with uh, the oversight board is like, there's, it's a hundred plus people international, inter internationally luminaries of like, the law and human rights and all these things. The, the purpose of the oversight board is to handle conflict, uh, excuse me, content conflict areas. So like Facebook kicks over a post where it's unclear whether or not it should stay on or whether Trump should be allowed on the platform was a decision that the oversight board handled. Problem is that the uh, participation of the board is tokenistic. There's no actual ownership in the trust. And so, you know, a couple of months ago, they made a decision that uh, the Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg just basically said like, no, we're not going to take it. And it's a bit of like, it's kabuki, right? It is the, it's, it's the illusion of participation, but with actually without the ability to affect and, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not just affect, but also see that decisions are carried through. It doesn't have much, much weight to it. Um, Organic Valley is not like failed, uh, but it is an example of a single, single stakeholder model and the challenges around it. So farmer cooperative, billion dollar business. Problem is that there's no participation of employees uh, or other folks in the supply chain. And it leads and has led to a lot of inner conflict within the organization because it sounds great and like alternative that I'm working for a farmer cooperative, but um, you know, you speak to the employees and they still feel like they're working for the, for sort of for the man and someone is benefiting and profiting off of their, um, off of their work and they don't have representation and they're not participating. Um, bearings is a family owned business example. So like problem with power, legitimacy, power, responsibility, and competency within these systems. Uh, it's like the three generation rule you find in family owned businesses, somebody's great, great grandson, like didn't what did not participate in the development of a system has no real skin in the game in terms of its success ends up you know running businesses and in, into the mountain so to speak the last one uh is like just i personally find this example really really fascinating um so the mojave water agency um Side note, San Bernardino is the largest county in the United States and 83% of it is located in the Mojave Desert. And uh, water, again, very big problem. And so in 1960, the uh, Mojave Water Agency was established with the goal of helping this whole region govern basins and help mitigate overdraft issues. Problem is that the uh, water basin system in the area is very, very complex. Like some of the basins are interconnected. Some of them are replenished by rivers. Some have like, you know, are replenished by local uh, um, precipitation. Uh, it's not an easy like, oh, there's a, there's a body of water or, oh, there's an irrigation system. It, it was very complex, right? And so the agency failed um, due to an inability to navigate that complexity. They couldn't figure out how should we resolve the diversity of these water basins and how they should be governed. Should they be governed as one or many, as independent or interdependent? Um, 
the whole region didn't and continues to not face the same overdraft issues. So some areas there's water's not a problem and other areas water's really a problem. And so they couldn't navigate the, the diversity of needs among people in the area. Um, they also had like different size pumpers. So like large corporate pumpers were located in one area and there were, you know, thousands of um, smaller pumpers and they couldn't really balance the needs and interests of, of those two different stakeholder groups. The problem was that there were too many diverse and competing interests at play and people lacked a common objective and understanding of what the problem was and why interdependence and decision making and governance and financing and building infrastructure would be beneficial to them. And so still today, you know, like uh, 50 years later, 60 years later, like there is still no governing body agency in an area that is in it like has serious environmental consequences to it and will massively impact, you know, millions of people who live in the area. Um, whoops, hold on. Um, yeah, I'm gonna fly through these very, very quickly because I spoke a lot. Uh, best practices in terms of thinking around uh, constitutions and, and, and rules one is around memberships, like you need to have group membership be clearly defined. People need to understand what their roles are in a system and then what their roles are in governance. Um, who belongs and why is really, really important for people to be able to cooperate with each other. Um, inclusivity, pretty basic. Those impacted by decisions should have an opportunity to participate in and affect decision making. Uh, the example of, you know, organically grown or um, organic valley not having employees participate in decision making is an example of a system that isn't designed to be inclusive. Uh, fairness, you, you know, governing bodies should respect and consider diverse stakeholder views uh, and consider the cost benefit distribution within an organization or a network. Um, and obviously should promote conflict resolution processes. It's part of the reason why the Huertas are such an incredible example. Um, transparency, process and rationale for decision making need to be clearly communicated. Legitimacy is really around like you, those who have power in a system need to have legitimacy about why they have that power. Again, family owned businesses are a really great example of how legitimacy breaks down. Um, performance around accountability, you know, what are the metrics for measuring the efficacy of a governance system and the effective use of resources? Uh, and in the case of a mission oriented, how is the mission, you know, being effectively stewarded? Um, you know, accountability is both around performance, but it's also around governing bodies taking responsibility for decisions and uh, demonstrating fulfillment of their responsibilities. Um, and developing structures and processes that are responsive to the needs and concerns of participants um, with clear pathways for moderation and, and dispute resolution. And those can be political, legal, social accountability. Um, and then lastly, capability. Again, like family owned businesses are a great example of this. You need appropriate expertise, lived experience and context um, in order to participate in decision making. And this is going to vary vastly based off of the organization and, and what the decision is and how much you are relying on expertise versus the wisdom of the crowds to, to make a given decision. So thank you. I, I am conscious that we have two minutes, but we also have two hours later. <laughs> and then we, I, I'm happy to answer. Uh, now, um, but also happy to wait until until we break out or, or go into the um, Pigmo board. I have so many questions. Great. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, I, Thanks so much. Um, my pleasure.